This is uh, stanza 31. So back to the poem. I saw Balder, the bloodied victim, Odin's son, resigned to his fate. There stood the mistletoe, growing slender and fair, high above the plain. So we have our first mention of Balder and the, the, the tragedy of Balder. Um, Balder, the, the bloodied victim, they only, they're only alluding to it, but we'll, we'll see in the, uh, I think in the next stanza that, that happens, but so Balder is Odin's son and he is the, the brightest, warmest, uh, most charismatic, you know, best in battle, basically every good thing you can imagine. That's what Balder is. And he's beloved by all. Uh, there, ha there has been some uh, discussion over whether he's actually uh, was uh, influenced by uh, Jesus Christ. I'm not sure. Um, he fits into the story and the archetypes sort of without the influence of Jesus Christ perfectly. So I'm, they may, I wouldn't be surprised if when Christianity came into uh, Northern Europe that they didn't see some parallels, but I actually, I don't think that um, the idea of Balder being sort of the best at everything is, uh, is a Christian uh, influence. I think, I think that is something that, that was originally there and was always sort of believed. Well, one note on that is that uh, there's some idea that synthesizing all the best aspects of the gods, of heroes, whatever, into one is the natural progression of polytheism, and it's why monotheism developed in the first place. It's an idea, and whether or not this is the direction that the Norse, the Germanics were going in, it's, well, it's, it's hard to say because they didn't take it any further. They Christianity came in and it was sort of done at that point. But Balder is the closest thing to this figure that is absorbing all the greatest things. And then he dies. And and and, and the, the, the parallels and the symbolism there to Christianity are certainly there in some respect, but it's, it's also the story of Balder is, is one of the oldest in, in existence in, in general. And, and as, as we go on here, uh, can talk about examples of, of where this story was even earlier in the in the uh, the record that we have, not just the poetic Edda. So, to me, that really says that Balder at least isn't a Christian fabrication. He was at the very least a, a central figure for a very long time, if if not uh, central to the mythology for uh, you know time immemorial. So, I would agree. An another point here that I quite like is the idea that he is the, in Larrington, it's uh, the phrasing is the bloody God. Uh, and, and in here and in Crawford, the bloodied victim. So the symbol of, of blood, it's one of the oldest symbols and, and one of the most widespread extant symbols that is found in deep prehistory for religious symbolism, the dusting of dead bodies, among other things, with red ochre to symbolize blood is one of the most widespread concepts. And so for Balder to be named here for the first time in this poem anyway as the bloodied god, uh, deriving that symbolism i don't think it's just about the literal blood of his death it's also blood as a symbol of life somewhat ironically it's it's that blood is the symbol of life force we all have blood in us and so that was the idea of the dusting of, of bodies with blood was to sort of symbolize that they still had this life force that's 
that's my understanding of it. That's that's really, really a basic overview. If, if you want more information, uh, Merce Aliade, who we, we mentioned last time, goes into it again in, in history of religious ideas and, and other places as well. So, um, but that was just something that uh, caught my eye here. The associating him with the symbol of of blood, I think, is is not so much no not just about his his uh, impending death, but also the fact that he is a symbol of life and it's it's not as well it's not his only uh his symbol either it's not his only uh uh name or epithet he's also no. called the the shining god or the right. the white god not white as in you know skin color but like that's how he looks like white isn't shining and so it's it's uh it's interesting that that is the symbol here blood is the symbol here as opposed to his shiningness which is also uh important for sure we also see, um, it mentioned that uh, Odin's son resigned to his fate. It means that he, he's, accepting, he's, he's accepting his fate that uh, he's going to die, that he, he's taking it on voluntarily, or at least not fighting against it. And as we'll see, there's a really a transformation of Baldur and a almost an initiation and it's important um, to note that he's going to it voluntarily that he's resigned to this fate because that's the only way or I guess that's the, the right way to um, to change is to accept to accept that it's going to be painful and that you're you're just going to go through it anyway and, and through that acceptance is how you're able to change rather than fighting it every step of the way and then getting stuck. So I thought that was a, an interesting, um, it, interesting that they put that in there too, that they, they know that no, it, it's important that he's resigned and, and is doing it voluntarily. Yeah. It, it's interesting. It, it's, um, the, the, the Baldur's death is prophesied more than once. And it's, uh, uh, and later on in a, in a different poem, you'll see that it's actually prophesized directly as in they, they know that this is what is kind of laid down. And so if you, as the story gets uh, a little bit deeper here, uh, Frigg, his mother, Odin's wife, gets every living being, every thing in the world to swear that they will not harm Baldur. And the only one, I believe it's actually that she does not make swear is the mistletoe. That's it's not right. that the mistletoe refuses or anything mal malicious like that, but she doesn't think the mistletoe could do anything. So that's almost a case of willful blindness, first of all, like For sure. not covering all your bases uh, in, in a simple case like that. But it's also, you know, the, the simplest, most harmless thing is, is what could actually destroy you and that, and that's where the, the mistletoe kind of comes here the mistletoe growing slender and fair the thing that shouldn't harm you the thing that you don't think would harm you is actually actually has the potential to definitely and it i don't think i i don't think arrogance is the right word but it's it's that idea that if you if you're willfully blind because she did decide not to ask. She thought it was too small. Like she saw it and then said, Oh, don't worry about it. It's those are the things that always come back and, and get you in the end. They, they always come back and bite you. So the small things that you ignore that eventually pile up and pile up and pile up and then become impossible to deal with. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, and that's exactly, it. it's the small things because it's not, it's just the small things that add up. It's not this big, huge thing right now. It, it's sort of the smallest flimsiest thing that she could have dealt with right then and there with the smallest of effort. And, but I mean, that's so true in, in life. I mean, that's, that, that is what, what gets you. It's the, uh, the smallest thing with, you know, someone in your family and then you don't address it and it, it builds from there. And then, yeah. So. Agreed. It's, uh, Definitely a tough one to unpack. I think I'll move on to the next uh, Sounds good. the next line here because uh, there's two more to this story directly. And so we'll just cover more there. Back to the poem. 
And, and actually, since it, it uh, connects, that we might have... Never mind. <laughs> that tree, which seemed harmless, caused a terrible sorrow when Hoth took a shot. Baldur's brother was born soon thereafter. He was Odin's son. He took vengeance while still just one night old. I'm going to save um, the part about Odin's brother for the next stanza because it they talk about it there. Um, plus, there's more than enough to talk about uh, <laughs> with the lines before. So again, it talks about mistletoe, which we've talked about, which seemed har- harmless and caused terrible sorrow, and we've we've covered that uh, when Ho took a shot. So what what happens here, and it. Again, these stories are, are well known to the people listening to this poem. Uh, Loki tricks Hode. Well, in some versions of the story, Loki tricks Hode into um, throwing a dart made of mistletoe at Balder because, as this is such a like a guy thing to do, they fit. They realize Balder is like impervious to pain and nothing can hurt him. So then he and his friends and brothers they start throwing stuff at him. Just like, oh, I wonder if this will do it. So they throw a sword at him and nothing happens. And it just like, that is so real. <laughs> I like, oh. So then, um, so either in some versions, Hode uh, is tricked by Loki and throws this dart of mistletoe. And because mistletoe uh, didn't agree not to hurt him, it kills him. In other versions, uh, Hode is kind of uh, jealous and throws the dart knowing that it'll kill Balder and and things go from there and seeing what happens after to to Hode it makes to me it almost makes more sense if Hode was jealous because the the vengeance that he receives is so awful that having it done by like him doing it by accident it, it doesn't seem like it, w- it would warrant that kind of uh, extreme uh, reaction. Um, either way, what I like to take from it is that um, Hode, the name means battle. And I think, and, and you, you'll you see this a lot, uh, well, with, with soldiers and people who fight in battles, th- there is a definitive, like, before the, first com- combat and then after. And I think what we're seeing here is the maturation of, of Balder because we're, we're, he is, he's on a journey. And so the Balder that um, lives in this world and is sort of the, the fun loving guy who gets stuff thrown at him has to die. And, Battle is often a way to kill the the boy, so that the, the man can can emerge. And you see this in all sorts of initiatory rites throughout history and throughout the world, where young men would have to fight or undergo some uh, horrible physical ordeal to um, to sort of emerge as the man, so that the, the boy would die. So like. Uh, I remember seeing like a National Geographic where they make gloves out of um, these huge leaves from the Amazon and then fill them with fire ants and then put the gloves on this, you know, 14 year old boy. But then after, you know, and he's put in a hut and it takes him like three weeks to recover from it kind of thing. But then afterwards, he's a man. He can, uh, he has a say in how the village is run. He can find a wife and do all that kind of stuff. And I, I think what we're seeing here is sort of an initiatory rite of, Balder being killed and the the boy Balder being killed so that he can come back as a man and take his rightful spot. Not to spoil anything. No, spoiler alert. <laughs> but take his rightful spot in in the new world. So that that's what I'm that that's my takeaway from uh this verse. No, that's a really good point. Uh the idea of of uh being transformed through what we would probably today consider to be trauma, but but 
a, in a transforming way, like something that is actually, um, you, you know, you can deal with it as, you know, a victim and just shut down and, you know, just be dead after, for all intents and purposes, be dead. For sure. After that, or grow from it and emerge from the other side, which which we don't see here yet. That's that's a good thing to to kind of note here is that we're you have to skip ahead quite a bit to to get to that he actually emerges on the other side. No issue with spoiling no. that at all. <laughs> that's that's a that's a key element of the story here. And uh yeah, just the idea that that uh that he would be emerging from that in, in a in a better sense uh, this is almost a parallel of the the female initiation that took place earlier in the last uh, in the last episode because for sure you know we have a female initiation there and uh, and a male initiation now there, there's always got to be a, a parallel you know neither uh, neither one should get neglected right like, uh, to me that was something that I was wondering about Freya is as an example the the example of a, of a the maiden who is, uh, you know, prior to marriage, prior to children, prior to family and whatnot, and then the figure of Frigg. And we're not sure if etymologically that's essentially the same word, just different phase of life sort of thing. Uh, Frigg is, you know, the the woman after she is a mother and is the head of the household and, uh, you know, powerful in her own right, which we'll see two poems from now, two poems from now, uh, powerful in her own right. Three poems from now. Doesn't matter. Uh, either way, Frigg is, is a, a fantastic figure in her own right, and the transformation from Freya to Frigg in a in a symbolic sense is something that doesn't really have a parallel in. Uh, to me, didn't really have a parallel until thinking about how Balder has this initiation of how you go from a boy to a man in in some cases. So I mean that it's it's fantastic, and there isn't really any other example in the mythology that we have that that's that fits it right i, I don't no. think there is so uh, another point uh, i'd like to make here is just the different stories you, you touched on a little bit dan uh, already the the different versions of the story uh and one reason that i have as well to think that hode originally was actually the malicious brother the hostile brother was because in the oldest version of the story that we have visible to us there is no loki in that story, it is actually just that Balder and Hode, uh, they're not even actually brothers, I don't think, in the in the original sense. They're actually uh, tribal leaders. This is in the, the Gesta Denorum, the uh, the uh, the creation of the Danes. I think that's what that translates Sorry. to in, in, in Latin by Saxo Grammaticus, a Danish. Uh, well, he was a monk. Everyone who could read and write was a monk at the time. But he uh, prudently, like Snorri, decided to going and take uh, a history of his of his people and uh, he he also has some influence like some of the stories there are also present in later sagas and a few other things so yeah that's a good one well we'll we'll for sure hit that sometime we're we're, we're not even thinking we're going to finish the poetic edit this year by the way <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway um uh, yeah, in that version of the story, it's it's hostile brothers. It's Cain and Abel. It's not uh, it's not this outside source, this Loki, this uh, figure of. We haven't even met Loki properly, have we? No. Well, we'll we'll meet Loki soon. Um, but but the and important to note here as well is that Loki isn't explicitly considered the one who does the stuff. In the poetic edda, in in here, what we've just read, Loki isn't explicitly involved, and I think that's important. That is important. In the prose edda, Snorri Sturluson goes into detail about how Loki is the one who is involved in this, and that's where what you just for sure mentioned actually all comes from. And Snorri, we're going to say again and again and again, you got to take him with a grain of salt. You got to take uh, his Christian influence with a grain of salt. We'll also give him the same treatment of sort of saying this is what we have available to us. And yes, it may or may not have been exactly what they believed. But in this particular case, I think going off of the earlier story, and there's there's actually archaeological evidence to essentially depicting this story from hundreds and thousands of years, not thousands, thousands is probably an exaggeration, Bronze Age, uh, they're called Bracteats, and they're these sort of circular things uh, about six inches 12 inches 
uh, large that have pictures on them and, and you can see symbols and whatnot. It's a great source of archaeological uh, heritage. And the the Balder story seems to be playing out there, and there may or may not be a Loki figure there, and it, it's 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 unclear. But uh, um, that, that's why I think it's important to definitely note that there are different versions of the story. And to me, it actually makes more archetypal sense if they are just straight up hostile brothers. If Hode kills Balder maliciously out of jealousy or out of competition or whatnot, and kills. Right, so th that's just my takeaway from this little line. What's important to note here? Yeah, I, I agree uh, totally with that. And it does make more archetypal sense um, with having Hode do it rather than um, having Loki influence Hode into doing it. And I guess we'll we'll talk about Loki in bigger detail in a little... Like, two stanzas. Yeah, two stanzas. Might as well finish this yeah, one let's off, do this one, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm realizing we probably should have split 32 down the middle. It might have made sense to do that anyway. It, it, it kind of all bleeds into each other anyway. But uh, I'll, I'll go with, uh, I'll reiterate a uh, bit of 32 into 33 here, just now. Yeah, sounds good. <clears throat> Baldur's brother was born soon thereafter. He was Odin's son. He took vengeance while still just one night old. He had never washed his hands nor combed his hair when he put Baldur's killer on the funeral pyre. Frigg wept in Fenselir for the woe of Valhalla. Have you learned enough yet, Allfather? When she asks that at the end there, like chills, right? Because it's just like, oh, you've just, you've just heard about how your son's going to die. And then, yeah, do you want to keep going? <laughs> Just gets worse. Yeah. So um, this is this is one of my favorite uh, parts because it, it talks about it, he's unnamed here, but um, a god named uh, Valley, and he's the the Norse god of vengeance, which is cool that they have one, whose sole role is just revenge. And what it, what it ends up happening is Odin. Um, Odin has a baby, not with Frigg actually, but um, the uh, the goddess's name I can't remember off the top of my head. But um, a valley is born that night, and basically born and then grows into a man, and mercilessly hunts down and kills Hod. And so, if you believe that Hod was sort of the innocent bystander in this, and just you know Loki's tool, that is like. That sucks for him. If he's, you know, this terrible person who wanted to kill uh, Balder out of jealousy, makes more sense. And it, it feels more like divine justice. Um, the referencing to him not washing his hands or combing his hair, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So in a lot of cultures... Uh, including like the Roman culture and uh, I know for a fact like Judaism in times of mourning um, combing your hair and not so much washing in the modern age but um, certainly back in the day washing anything that had to do with taking care of yourself was um, was almost wasn't forbidden, but you were expected not to do it because you were so upset. And so, for example, uh, one of the emperors in Rome, if you see his face on a coin, I, th I think it was Claudius. Um, he's got a beard because he wasn't shaving because when he came in, when he became the emperor, I believe it was his father had passed away. So he was in mourning and they, they showed that on the coins with his uh, face on it. And then in Judaism, it's called uh, sitting Shiva and they don't. You don't cook anything. You, you don't uh, wear nice clothes. You don't do anything other than mourn the person. You're, um, it's supposed to uh, distract. You're not supposed to have any distractions. You're supposed to just sort of sit with the pain and uh, and get through it. And so you, you, I think you see some of that in this, where the idea of mourning that Valley is a a product of mourning, and I know. You can see this in um, 
geez, this is going to get dark in like, um, trials where, uh, you know, parents are seeing the person who murdered their kids or whatever. And there is that, there is that, uh, impetus or that, that feeling, even just think for yourself, if something happened to a loved one in your, in your morning, you would want to exact revenge. You would want to balance the scales. And this is exactly that. This is that expression of it. Um, I know in the story of Cain and Abel, um, God marks Cain after he kills Abel and says, no one can harm you in an effort to sort of quell any blood feuds or whatever. But there doesn't seem to be that in, um, in these myths, there is that it's kind of like <laughs> you want a blood feud, you got a blood feud. So th there is this idea of honorable vengeance and something else that's interesting is, that, um, there was a class of warriors called berserkers who would, um, they were all, they wouldn't bathe and they, they wouldn't comb their hair and the word berserker means bear shirt. And so it was this idea of becoming a bear and they were considered, uh, sort of the elite warriors of Odin. They would get themselves into a frenzy before going into battle and they wouldn't wear armor. And, um, they're, they're quite fierce and, and feared because they seemed crazy. And I, I think you're seeing shades of that with, with Valley who may have been the first berserker who. Interesting. Um, and then thinking of that, like it makes it even more terrifying for Hode having this person born one day coming after him. So, um, and then talking about Frigg, of course, uh, was, uh, Baldur's mother, uh, in her offensive is her hall. And she knew the, uh, the fate of everyone. And it, or it said that she knows the fate of everyone, how everyone's going to die. And, um, think she also knew the the fate and the, the woe of Valhalla that she knew what was going to be happening because of this and that that's sort of my take on uh, on this verse yeah it's it's a big one it's it's heavy it's it's heavy uh I, li I liked you mentioning Cain and Abel uh which is honestly another reason why I just think this is a, the hostile brothers story it, because if you have something so similar in such different cultures i, I mean unless this was a 100 christian influence 100 which I, I think is impossible really i think is impossible because uh, for no other reason than you you can see such parallels in so many societies right anyway uh it just makes sense that it's the natural uh, conclusion of this hostile brother's story is that vengeance is going to be sought. And, and it, it isn't the detail that God says, here's a mark on your head so that if anyone harms you, it, like it, it was almost a description of if anyone harms you, your people will kill seven of their people, then their people will kill 77 of yours. It was like a description of what would actually eventually happen. And the, the story ends with, uh, with a uh, descendant of Cain's eventually, eventually uh, creating the first weapons of, of war. Right. So the, the progression at the end is that, you know, vengeance is just going to boil over, boil over, boil over. And so, I mean, that's to the credit of societies to put in, some kind of restriction on that sure. in uh, in Anglo-Saxon, for example, and, and as well in the Norse, they they have concepts of of weird guild, uh, basically the price paid if if you've murdered someone or or done any sort of uh, harm to prevent blood feuds, and I mean that's that's the same concept I would say, but uh, in this case, I think it was it was broadly, you know, you've killed the best person in our midst do you have to die and and i think it just it it makes perfect sense here if this was the punishment for some uh malicious intentional act i do want to flip that around though even in the case of him not doing it intentionally or not doing it with malice or anything like that it's it's still that's the price you pay and so so here here's 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 one thing as an aside I don't mind these stories having 
possible interpretations. For sure. It's it's not our goal here to find the one true answer. It's to find lessons and ways to apply it and and reasons why these things were passed down for so long, right? Like that's that's what we're here for. Exactly. And I think both sides of this story have merit. It's 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 in this case it's like even in the case of you you did something by accident, what does that say if your penalty still has to be at least well, okay, it can't go higher than then you're gonna die. But you know, you still be culpable for your own actions, no matter what. No matter what. Whether you intended to do something or not, you have to live with the consequences. And and really, is that just a lesson of to, to me, I think that's a lesson of you have to have control over your own actions. You have to, as far as possible, know what you're doing. Be in control. Have that responsibility. Because otherwise, you know, someone malicious could use you as a tool for their own aims. Right? Like, the, to me, both sides of it are, are perfectly valid and perfectly good lessons. And I don't care whether one is Christian influence. It's, it's still a good damn good lesson for sure actually um i'm just thinking about that now um that there are different lessons to take away from each one but they're both have great lessons because you're right um something that um you know jordan peterson always talks about in his biblical lectures and, and his classes that you never get away with anything and there's always a price to pay and so regardless of whether he did it on purpose or not, there's a price to pay. The um, Something else I wanted to, to mention about this, oh, actually, before I move on, there's always a price to pay and, it, and it always, it's always relentless. It always, like it always comes to collect and there's nothing you can do other than pay it. And hopefully um, you can voluntarily pay it. Because otherwise it'll take it from you and that's much harder. Uh, something else I wanted to talk about this is um, how quickly uh, Valley is born. And this idea that when, when an ideal is killed, things fall apart in quickly and in spectacular fashion. And the example I have of that is when uh, Nietzsche says God is dead and then goes on about, you know, how much blood will be spilled in the 20th century because the ideal of ideals is now, is now gone. And I think we have, and we'll be seeing this, but with Balder being this ideal, this ideal being and now is killed, things fall apart very quickly. And it's something that, it's sort of that tipping point where you actually can't go back now. There's no, there's no return from it. It, uh, <laughs> it's sort of that proverbial. It's hit the fan, and it's, yeah, you, know, you, you can't, you can't bring that back. It, it's, you just have to now. Now you're in the how does this play out part. It's not, uh, you can't fix it, and you can't put, it, you can't put it back together. You're going to be creating something new uh, after it falls all apart. And it's going to. Well, it, it, I mean, we're not going to have any more positive stories here. No. <laughs> like, 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 for real, we're, we're not, we don't have any good stories. Nothing is going to be feel good from here on out. So, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a really good point. Shall we? Oh, I, I had oh, one last perfect. thing I wanted to just touch on to, to, to fill out this whole story, to recap it a little bit. The motif... Here, the motif of the story is really the life, death, rebirth, God story cycle. You know, in, in, in Christianity, obviously, Jesus Christ is the, is the embodiment of that story, but it's in dozens of other cultures. But I just wanted to focus on a couple here, which give at least light examples of similar gods in very related mythologies, very related uh, just as a uh, an aside, I, th I think we we broadly consider the Celtic, Slavic, and Baltic um, 
societies, mythologies, what have you, as being closer, more closely related to each other than otherwise. And with the exception of the Celtic, which has a lot of uh, of uh, Italic uh, Roman, for, for lack of a better term, I wish there was one, influence, they were they were quite close geographically if you think about it the the Celts were in France and uh, and in uh, what's now Spain quite a bit and that's very close to the Italian peninsula right so just proximity but with the exception of Celtic as maybe kind of a, a bridge there these other cultures are kind of more uh, related to the Germanic than kind of anything else there's also the uh, the Finnic cultures uh which is the the modern day sami and and uh, finland estonia hungary as well actually and they're a completely different language group but they have proximity so that's that's kind of a big deal here as far as they have a lot of uh cross uh um you know the cross ideas right so sure. so that so they merge that but the examples i wanted to just mention here is that uh you know in these related cultures uh, there are others that are close to Balder. And actually, in a lot of cases, they're much less well-documented. So one is the, the Gaulish Belenus, which was a, a sun god, a, a shining god, and he goes through this life-death-rebirth cycle, theoretically. Um, Slavic, there is uh, Bielobog, which is a deity of the light and the sun, uh, really only attested as the opposite of, I, I should have written his name down, essentially the god of darkness. Uh, but he's also a possible life, death, rebirth type god. And then another much more well attested is the Greek Apollo, who is the son of Zeus, god of the sun, has his own trials, tribulations, things like that, lots of stories. We're not going to get into, I doubt we're going to get into the Greek ever not that it's it's not worth going into but greek and roman are really what we would consider classical mythologies sure. which which get a lot of uh, airtime already and so we're uh, we're striving for something uh, going into kind of these these stories that are a little less well traveled here but apollo is an important at, an important attestation of similarity here and you know they none of these stories are identical to what balder goes through and, and and actually, I mean, in a lot of ways, you can almost look at the Balder story and say, well, okay, that, well, that looks a lot like Christ, a lot like Jesus. Maybe that's Christian influence. But I think just the existence in general of these other gods in related cultures, not not like they're the same. They're, they're, they certainly have their differences and they certainly have their own mythological understanding of the world, which is different and separate. And that's a very good thing. But their existence to me, says something like this is a concept that was deep in Indo-European mythology for a very, very long time because it exists in so many of these cultures that came out of proto-Indo-European society culture. So, so to me, this is this is very good. And and uh, um, there's even a, a, an idea that uh, maybe we can reconstruct a word for for this this god in Proto Indo European based on all this. And so, I mean, it's yeah. There's some there's some cool little other parallels in in other cultures, which to me point to this being a central story theme motif in in culture in in the Norse Germanic culture and. We we've we haven't even scratched the surface, honestly, of the significance of the death of Balder and the significance of his story, and and really, it's not even just time. It's more like wrapping our heads around it. There's For there's sure. just so much here, and we're gonna we're gonna see Balder again, even in the Voluspa here, also in other stories and and poems, and uh, hopefully we can expound upon this story and cycle and motif, but I just wanted to, uh, cover that, uh, he is, uh, similar to these other figures in this life, death, rebirthing is something that is so central to Indo-European mythology that it cropped up in all these different cultures as well. So just to underline the importance of this story, it, it might be the most important story uh 
yeah, it, it, it might at the end of the day, the, just the symbolism of this God, this great God of life dying and then being reborn. It might be one of the most important in by my, by my sure. estimation anyway. So, 